The Warlord of the Air by Michael Moorcock, 1971. This is the 36th book in the A Science Fiction Specials Series 1. That means there are only two more books after this that I have to complete reading Series 1. The 37th book will be The Midnight Dancers by Gerard F. Conway and The Eclipse of Dawn by Gordon Eklund. Today's book, the cover, is by Davis Meltzer. And this time, as opposed to the 35th book, there is a note on the back crediting the artist. He also does the 37th book, his third book in the series, Davis Meltzer. Credit on the back. But for the last one, we return to Leo and Diane Dillon. This is a little unusual for them. And there's their credit. This is a novel within a novel. We have Michael Moorcock inheriting the writings of his grandfather after both his grandfather and grandmother have died. His grandfather, also Michael Moorcock, met a man on a remote island near India in 1903. This man, Oswald Bastable, tells a fantastic story and gives a manuscript to Michael Moorcock's grandfather. This manuscript makes up this novel. Bastable's story starts out in northeast India on an expedition to a temple that is on the side of a mountain in the Himalayas. The city of temples is called Teku Benga. In trouble among the temples, Bastable flees and falls into an ancient temple. This temple is thousands of years old, so old that people do not know who made it. He's unconscious, and when he wakes up, the city has gone through an earthquake. Buildings have tumbled, but there's no corpses. Cracks in the road and buildings have grass and shrubs growing in them. Something is seriously wrong. Then he spots an air dirigible. He waves and shouts, and they come and rescue him. When in the air, he can see the ruins of the city and that a great chasm has replaced the path that led up to the city. When rescued, he is questioned by a major and a doctor on the airship. They ask him when he left for Teku Benga. He replies, June 25th, sir. Um, and what year? Why, 1902, sir. The doctor and the major stared at each other in some concern. That's when the earthquake happened, all right, Major Powell said quietly. 1902, almost everyone killed, and there were some English soldiers there. Oh, by God, this is ridiculous. He returned his attention to me. You are in serious condition young man. I wouldn't call it amnesia, but some sort of false memory. Mind playing you tricks, huh? Maybe you've read a lot of history, like me. Perhaps you're an amateur archaeologist, too. Well, I expect we can soon cure you and learn what really happened. What's so odd about my story, Major? Well, for one thing, old chap, you're a bit too well preserved to have gone up to Tekubenga in 1902. That was over 70 years ago. This is July 15th. The year, I'm afraid, is 1973 AD, of course. Does that ring a bell? I shook my head. Sorry, Major, but I'll agree with you on one thing. I'm obviously completely insane. Let's hope it's not permanent, smiled the doctor. Probably been reading a bit too much H.G. Wells. Realizing that he is now in a future, Bastable learns as much as he can. There's not a lot. It's pretty much like his world just continued. Empires and colonies, empirical rule. There has been no world wars. Travel and commerce have become possible with dirigibles, great airships. Small and large, they travel to the great cities of the world. Bastable travels from India back to London in only three days. Now, I think I might need to remind you that this is written 
from 1902. There is no knowledge of the history from 1902 to 1973. The reader, however, sees that this is an alternate history. In a world of empires, the colonies are subservient to them. Unrest is stirring. Bastable claims he has amnesia. He trains to be a dirigible officer. His career starts to bring him around the world, and we get glimpses of this world. Ultimately, we see that this isn't a utopia, and we fall in to the revolutionary struggles. In the last 20 to 30 pages, we have a great war battle that's reflected in the cover art. Who is the warlord of the air? Now, due to the structure of the novel, we know that Bastable will return and get this manuscript to Michael Moorcock's grandfather. Michael Moorcock himself now knows that there is some sort of an alternate history out there, if Bastable is to be believed. Moorcock seems to have a lot of fun writing like H.G. Wells. He references H.G. Wells a number of times. I actually think it is a little bit more like Edgar Rice Burroughs. First person narrative, adventures, betrayal, intrigue, and a battle in the air. Only a discussion of the politics of the time is something that I don't think Edgar Rice Burroughs would have had in his novel. From page 144 to 145. I think you could say that Dawn City is a beginning. It is conceived in terms of the future. London is an ending, the final conception of a dead ideology. What do you mean? Europe has used up its dreams. It has no future. The future lies here in China, which has a new dream, a new future. It lies in Africa, India, throughout the Middle East and the Far East, perhaps in South America too. Europe is dying. I, for one, regret it. But before she dies, she offers certain notions of what is possible to the countries she has dishonored. You are saying we are decadent? If you like. There are a couple people from our history that you'll recognize in different ways in this novel. One, an American, is altered in ways that could upset people. Remember that Moorcock is from the UK. I give this found manuscript rollicking adventure through an alternate history 8 out of 10. Michael Moorcock has written two novels for Terry Carr in the Ace Science Fiction Special, Series 1. And he's done it at a time where he was an editor for New World magazine. This was a particularly full and creative time in Michael Moorcock's life. So what are some works of Michael Moorcock that you enjoy? Do you like alternate histories? What do you think about a writer writing in another writer's style from about 70 years ago? Let me know in the comments. I'm interested to see where the discussion goes. Until next time. Keep reading.